Well, welcome everyone. My name is Alita and I'm so happy to be with you today. And as Jason just mentioned, we are in a series right now on the book of Jonah. And last week, Chris taught on the first three verses of the book. That's kind of where we parked it. We were just in the first three verses. And so today we're actually gonna take some time and look at the rest of chapter one. And I wanna give you a bit of a roadmap for where we're headed today. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna actually read chapter one together. Don't worry, it's, it's not too long. And then we're gonna take our time and we're gonna just sort of move through the book together. And this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna consider what lessons we can learn about God through Jonah's life. Because here's the thing, this book has Jonah's name on it, but this book of the Bible isn't really trying to teach us about Jonah as much as it is trying to teach us about the nature and the character of the living God. Okay, so buckle up, strap in. We're going to go ahead and read chapter one together. Jonah 1, beginning in verse 1. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai Go, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All of the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah, but Jonah had gone below deck where he laid down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up, get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And he answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. And the sea was getting rougher and rougher. And so they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they, then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you with a very grateful heart that when we run, we cannot outrun you. And that when we run, you come after us. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak and teach us this morning. In the precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, I love the book of Jonah. I've actually loved it for some years now. I started studying it about, I want to say, 10 years ago. And, and I've come to call Jonah my favorite dysfunctional friend in the Bible. And here's why. It's because he's a runner. He's a runner. Yes, we know he's a prophet. We know that he is a worshiper of the living God, or so he says he is. 
We know that he has a real function and role in the community of Israel uh, to, to speak on behalf of the living God. We know these things about him, but still he runs. And so I read the book of Jonah and particularly the particularly this first chapter, and I see a person who claims to love God, who claims to worship him, but runs anyway. And I don't know, I'm just, I'm sobered by that because I recognize even within myself, I don't know about you, but I know within myself that there are times in my life where even though I believe in the living God and even though I worship him and even though I say I'm his disciple and I wanna follow him, that all I want to do really sometimes is, is run from him to run away from the thing that he's calling me to do. So I sympathize with Jonah. I get him. Last week, Chris gave such a a great teaching on um, the reasons why Jonah likely ran away or likely tried to run away from the Lord. And I really uh, suggest and encourage you to go back and listen to those reasons. But today we're just going to sit in the rest of chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. And so here's what we know so far. We know that the Lord has called Jonah to go to Nineveh, but Jonah has run in the opposite direction. We know that Jonah has gotten on a boat. If you'll remember last week, Chris uh, told us that great line about when we want to run from God, there will always be a boat. So Jonah has found himself a boat and he's headed across the Mediterranean Sea to a city called Tarshish. And here's what we know about Tarshish. Tarshish is uh, located in modern day Spain. And for those of you who may just right off the top of your head may not know exactly where Spain is, don't be embarrassed, I had to look it up too. Spain is on the southwestern tip of Europe. In other words, if you wanted to leave on a boat to get out of Spain and you tried to to cross, you would actually um, be in the Atlantic Ocean and the next place you would hit is North America. So the reason I'm telling you this is because for Jonah, Tarshish would have literally been like the end of the world. And here's what I want to put before you is that he was not just trying to get away from God. He was trying to get as far away as possible from him. So Jonah has found a boat and he's headed away as far away as possible from Nineveh. And he's running even more so from God. He knows it's not going to work. He tries it anyway. Bless his little heart. And of course, we know that it doesn't work. So I want to read verse 4. It says, The Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. So Jonah runs from the Lord, and the Lord comes after Jonah. The Lord sends a storm after Jonah, and it wasn't a little storm either. We just read in verse 4 that it was actually a violent storm. And actually, in in verse 5, we can get a clue about the nature of this storm because of the reaction of the sailors. I love this kind of stuff in Scripture when it kind of gives us um, clues, but most scholars agree that these sailors were very likely Phoenician sailors. And here's um, the thing about Phoenicians. Phoenicians were legendary for their seamanship skills. They were legendary for being great navigators. By trade, by occupation, most men were um, sailors. And so it stands to reason when we read this story that uh, these sailors who were terrified, this is a different kind of storm because they had likely weathered some pretty serious storms in their occupation before, but something about this storm was different. They were terrified. That's how bad it was. And so for the next few moments, I want us to just kind of sit in what could be an uncomfortable thought based on what we've just read, and it's this. It's that the Lord sent a storm after Jonah. Some of us might not like to hear that. Some of us might be more inclined to think that when bad or hard things happen, like a violent storm, surely it isn't God. It can't be God because we might say the God that I believe in, he doesn't send storms. He delivers from storms. Or maybe if you are new to the Christian faith um, or you are maybe just a skeptic of, of Christianity in general, you just may read this and think like what kind of a God sends a violent storm to chase down one of his followers? 
And so here's what I want to put before us today. That God loved Jonah so much that he wasn't afraid to send a storm after him in order to retrieve him. I, um, I grew up in a Christian home. Um, I'm a PK, that is uh, <laughs> that short for pastor's kid. So I've just kind of grown up always in and around the church. And um, I don't know how else to say this except that I have just always loved and believed in Jesus my whole life. Like I remember as a little girl, like little in my bedroom, um, praying and reading my little storybook Bible. And I remember just talking to, I, I wouldn't, I don't even know if I would have called it praying. I just talked to him almost like he was just a friend in my room. And I remember doing that often as a little girl and I had a whiteboard and I would write notes to him. I mean, the reason I'm telling you this is because it, he was so real to me. And he was just always such a sweet presence in my life. I just never had a faith problem. But when I was a teenager, through a series of different unfortunate circumstances, I made a real about face. And I knowingly, willfully, deliberately ran from God. I did despicable shameful things, the kind of things that even as an adult when they sometimes just kind of out of nowhere will pop into my mind that just make me shake my head. I became an expert at lying to my family, my parents. I gave up sacred parts of myself to people who did, who had no right to them. And I began to live this double sort of life. And I knew the mess I was in. I knew it. And for four years, four long, heavy years, I knew, I knew the Lord was after me. I knew that he was trying to address the sin in me. I knew he was calling me to repent. But the more he spoke, the further I ran. The closer I could feel him sort of getting near me, the harder I would push away. And when he would send friends into my life to lovingly confront me, by the way, thank God. God, and I mean that, thank you, God, for those kind of friends, I would just ditch them and I'd go find some new friends. You know, the kind of friends that would just like approve of the life I was living. The kind of friends who were like celebrating my sin and didn't judge me. And so the more he spoke, the further I ran. And the thing is, it's not because I didn't believe in him, because I did. As I just told you, I knew, I knew he was real. I never had a faith problem. I just didn't want to obey him. <laughs> I just didn't want to live the way he wanted me to live. And so this progressed and escalated over four very formative years in my life. And I remember so clearly the night that God came for me. I could probably circle it on a calendar for you if I had to. And if I could liken it to anything, I would say it felt like a violent storm came for me. It was as though the Lord kind of sent this along and he was saying, enough, enough, Alita, enough running, enough trying to hide from me, enough. And that night forced my life and my lies out into the open in a public way. It was embarrassing. It was hard. But, and I mean it when I say this, the storm that God sent after me saved my life. I don't even want to think of what my life would be like if I had stayed on the path that I had chosen for myself. And when I tell you that he came after me I mean it. I experienced it. And when I tell you that he tore down the lies I had built up around myself for four long years, I mean it. When I tell you that he took a broken, trapped young woman who was not even looking for him, but was actually dead set on getting as far away from him as possible, and then he completely set me free, I mean it. I have experienced it. I have lived it. And I am so grateful I've been thinking about it a lot 
this week in preparation for this message. Like, who am I, Lord, that, that you, the God of the universe, would see fit to come after me? I didn't even know I needed rescuing, but you came after me. So here's what I want to suggest to us this morning. If the book of Jonah can teach us anything in this first chapter, it teaches us that the living God comes after us even when we willfully disobey, even when we run, even when we want to get as far away from him as possible, even when we want nothing at all to do with him, even when we think we don't deserve it. God is so good, so merciful, so kind that he is willing to send a storm after us in order that he might retrieve us. That's the kind of God he is. And listen, sometimes the most merciful thing that God can do is send a storm into our lives. If that's the thing that is going to get our attention, if that's the thing that's going to reroute us to him. And this is good news. This is good news that the living God comes after us. He comes after you. You. I can't see you on the other side of that camera but I want you to know I've been praying for you this week. The living God comes after you, and I hope that for some of you, this is the thing that you needed to hear today. He's after you. He comes after your children. I'm thinking also of some moms and dads who maybe you have some adult children, and they have gone wayward, and you are on your knees for them, and you're just beside yourself. I want to remind you today that the living God comes after your children. He has not forgotten them. He loves them. He is for them. He is coming after them. He comes after your parents. He comes after your friends, your coworkers. He comes after the person who cut you off yesterday. He comes after the the politicians, the ones that you disagree with. He comes after our enemies. Listen, I want you to know that if you have breath in your lungs this day, he wants you and he is in pursuit of you. You are not too far gone. The living God comes after you and that is good news. It is good news. And I want to be clear that God does not always come after us with a storm. But sometimes he does. Sometimes he does. And I can tell you from personal experience that it's a severe mercy. It is a severe mercy. But he's not afraid to use hard things to get us back to him. We can try to run from him. He will keep running after us. It's good news. So Jonah has found his boat. He's trying to run from God, and God is running after him by means of a storm. Meanwhile, where is Jonah? Well, verse five tells us that he had gone below deck and he was in a deep sleep. Um, If you are the kind of person that likes to like mark up your Bibles and highlight and circle, one thing that might be worth circling, um, I love marking up my Bible, but one thing that might be worth circling is the word down in chapter one, D-O-W-N, the word down. It's a significant word because I want you to notice that um, the Lord told him originally to arise or rise up and go to Nineveh, but Jonah actually runs the other way and he goes down. He doesn't rise up anywhere. He goes down to Joppa is the language of scripture. Then he goes down into the ship. And then he goes even further down into the inner part of the ship where he then laid down to go to sleep. The author of Jonah uses these words on purpose. The implication here being that Jonah was doing the opposite of what he was supposed to be doing. Jonah is not arising and going anywhere. He is going down deeper and deeper and deeper in an effort to get away from the living God. And so Jonah thinks himself safe and on his way. He wasn't just resting his eyes. He felt so secure that he was in a deep sleep. 
You know, that kind of sleep where you're just like, you're just out of it. Nothing and nobody can possibly wake you up. It's like you're hooked up to a, you know, an IV full of NyQuil. You were just like out for the count. This was Jonah, the kind of sleep that he was in. Meanwhile, up above, the whole ship is about to break apart. I mean, there was chaos, complete chaos happening. Wind is howling. It is raining. The sailors are yelling. They are, uh, they're praying, all of them. And then they're coming down where Jonah's sleeping, by the way, because he was sleeping where the cargo was. And they're pulling this cargo out. And meanwhile, he's just out, just out for the count, still unaware of the whole thing. This is the way that sin works, by the way. Sin does this to us. Sin lures us in. And it makes us feel safe, it kind of numbs our senses, and it dumbs us down. And we become painfully unaware and oblivious to the danger all around us. I love the way Matthew Henry describes the scene of Jonah. Matthew Henry is a, um, a minister and a commentator from like the 16 and 1700s. So this is a bit of like old language, but I think he just nit- hits the nail on the head. This is what he says about Jonah being asleep on the ship. He says, sin is of a stupefying nature. What a great word. Sin is of a stupefying nature. It is the policy of Satan to rock people asleep in carnal security that they may not be sensible of their misery and danger. 21st century Alita translation, sin makes us stupid. Sin gives us a false sense of peace when in reality the whole boat is about to go down. And so what happens next in verses 5 and 6, the captain finds Jonah asleep. And besides just being baffled, that Jonah was asleep. The captain responds with some really blunt honesty. And he says to Jonah, how can you be sleeping at a time like this? Get up. Listen, sometimes we just need someone to tell us to get up, to get up, to stop sleeping, to stop pouting, to stop being stupefied by our sin, to alert us to what is going on around us. And we're just too blind to see it for ourselves, to tell us to wake up, arise, get up and call on God. That's what the captain said to Jonah. I hope in our church community that we would all be courageous enough to welcome people into our lives who care about us enough to lovingly like step on our toes a little bit when they see us going astray. People who love us and can confront us without our immediate, immediately being offended. I hope that's the kind of people that we're being formed into. And I'm not saying that that's who the captain is to Jonah. They didn't, they didn't know each other. They weren't in relationship with one another. But the reality nonetheless is that this pagan Phoenician captain is the one who calls Jonah out. Get up, he says. Stop with the going down. Get up and pray to your God. In verse 7, we learn that the sailors decide to cast lots. And the lot, unsurprisingly, falls to Jonah. And I love this line of questioning that they, that they give him. It's like a mini interrogation in verse 8 where they're like, who, who are you? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? I can just imagine they're just, they're not even giving Jonah time to answer. It's just one question after the other. And finally, for the first time in the book of Jonah, we hear Jonah himself speak. And these are the first words to come out of his mouth in verse 9. I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. See, I read that and I think it's kind of funny, like almost worth a chuckle. Like as readers, we can see the disconnect between what he is saying and what he's done so far, between his actions and between his words. But the sailors, the pagan Phoenician sailors, see it too. They see the disconnect too, and their response to Jonah is, What have you done? What have you done? This isn't a question as much as it is an exclamation. 
And the book of Jonah has so many ironies in it all. We could just spend like a whole day talking about all the ironies throughout the book. But this is one of them, that the self-proclaimed follower and worshiper of God is running from God and Jonah himself cannot see the problem, but everyone else on the boat who doesn't follow the living God can clearly see the problem. So now it's just all out in the open and the sailors ask Jonah in verse 11, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Jonah responds, verse 12, pick me up, throw me into the sea. I know or it will become calm. I know it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. I think we have this cultural ethos which says that what I do in private doesn't matter. What I do in private doesn't matter. Like, it's my own life. What I'm doing in private doesn't affect other people. Just let me live my life. But the truth is that sin shapes you and forms you into a different kind of person. Sin done in isolation never stays in isolation. Ultimately, our sin always impacts other people. Tim Keller says says it this way. He says, All sin has storm clouds attached to it. All sin has storm clouds attached to it. We know that God has sent a storm after Jonah. But there is a further reality. And I think it's true in the case of Jonah that some storms are equally brought about by our own sin. Like consider this. Would God have needed to send the storm after Jonah if he had been walking in obedience? No. No. But Jonah does sin. So the storm that God sends after Jonah was a result of Jonah's disobedience. All sin has storm clouds attached to it. And so Jonah's sin, while done in isolation, thinking only about himself, ends up impacting others. And it's the same for you and I. Our sin, those deep, dark, secret things that we think won't hurt anyone else, they shape you. They form you into a certain kind of person. And eventually it will leak out and it will impact the people that you love, the people around you. And so here in the story is where we could, the very first time, if we, ha- if we were reading the story for the very first time and we didn't know the end of the story, we might think, well, this is all about to go awry. Everybody is getting ready to die because of one man's sin. But I love this. Watch what happens because God weaves it all together in a way that only he can. So at first, the sailors refuse to throw Jonah overboard. In fact, they try even harder to save him. Again, this is another irony. Jonah was sent to save pagans in Nineveh and he ran away because he didn't want to see them saved. Now he's on a boat full of pagans and they're doing everything they can to save his life because they don't want to kill him. But eventually, these sailors hesitantly, prayerfully throw Jonah overboard because they know that that's what's being required of them. And what happens? In verse 16, we read, The men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. What ends up happening is the very thing that Jonah was trying to avoid in the first place. And it's that non-Hebrew pagan people end up turning and embracing the living God. And here's what I want us to see. That God uses Jonah's Willful, deliberate disobedience to reach the sailors. Jonah runs from God. God comes after Jonah. And in the process, he doesn't just end up retrieving Jonah. God also retrieves others, rescues others. And this is the kind of God that we have. A God who uses our mistakes. A God who can redeem, beautifully redeem our messes. And if you are anything like me, Some of you might look at your life, your mistakes, and you think, it's just too much. It's too much. There's not one good thing that could even remotely come out of the messes that I've made. 
that I've been running far too long. I'm too broken, too damaged, burned too many bridges. God could not possibly use my story or my life. And I want to tell you today, just from a, I hope you can hear this from a really tender heart towards you right now, that you are not too far gone. That God is set on you. That he loves you. He is for you. He is not against you. He wants you and he comes after you. I said earlier that if there is anything this first chapter of Jonah teaches us is that the living God does indeed come after us. And so I actually just want to widen the lens a little bit to consider something. It's, we know that God sends a fish to save Jonah. That's at the very end of chapter one. He's already sent a storm, but now he's going to send a fish. And we'll get to that next week. Jared's going to preach. It's going to be awesome. I know it. But here is what I want us to consider. That if we keep reading the story of Scripture and we move on into the New Testament, we learn that God actually has a much bigger plan in mind for how he would save his people. And it wasn't with a storm. It wasn't with a fish. Ultimately, God would send his son to save humanity once and for all time. God was and is so set on us, on you and I, that he sent Jesus, his perfect, blameless, innocent son, to take on our guilt, our brokenness, our worst mistakes, to take on our willful, shameful, despicable sins. Romans 5, 8 says this. It says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I love that. You see, God knew what he was getting into when he chose us. He embraced our condition just as we were. He knows all about our baggage. And he sent Jesus anyways. It's still wild to me that God would choose to do this that he would choose to send his son for the guilty ones. And I have to tell you that I've just never gotten over it. When I sit and I think about it, I've just never, ever gotten over him. Never gotten over the fact that he came for me, that he made something ridiculously beautiful that I didn't deserve out of my mess. And it is one of the greatest joys of my life to be able to say to you that he wants to do the same for you. He wants to do the same for you. And so this morning, as we close, I just want to actually want to pray for two different groups of people right now. First, I want to pray for those of you who, who maybe would say, yeah, I've been running from God. And this idea of him coming after me is like a, I don't really know what to do with that. Some of you might be struggling with that. Some of you might feel really warm and tender towards the Lord because you know he's coming after you. But I just wanna pray if you would say that, yeah, I've been running from God. Let's just, let's just pray. Living God, we recognize that you don't give up on your children. Despite us, despite the messes that we have made, that none of us are too far gone you haven't drawn a line in the sand for us to say, well, not that one. That one's too messed up. No, we are all welcomed in. You sent Jesus to satisfy our guilt, 
He's taken it upon himself. And because of the sacrifice Jesus made, we can now be in right relationship with you. I thank you that you are so kind, that it is your kindness that leads us to repentance. And you are so kind that you are not afraid to allow us to walk through hard things if that means that it will get us back to you. You are so good. You are so wise. And I pray for those tuning in today, listening, Lord, that you would speak to hearts right where they are, that you would let them feel your pursuit of them. Allow them to feel it, Lord. Draw hearts back to you. We don't want to be stupefied by our sin anymore. We want to be set free. Amen. I also want to pray for those of you who maybe have friends or family who have been running from the Lord for a long time and you've been the one praying and you're just getting real weary. <laughs> like, I don't know. Maybe your prayer, it just feels like your prayers are sort of hitting the wall and you're kind of like, maybe they are too far gone. I don't, I don't know. I want to pray for you today to be encouraged, to just to remind you again that the Lord has not written off those friends, those loved ones, and for you not to write them off either, to keep persisting in prayer. So let me just pray, pray for you. God, I thank you for faithful people who pray people who continue to bring before you sons, daughters, friends, family, people in their lives who they know are running from you. We need the people who get on their knees before you, living God, to advocate and pray for these, these runners. And so I pray that even, even right now you would breathe um, just a fresh renewal of, of like just wanting to get on knees and pray for these wayward ones. Like the weariness would be lifted. They would have a fresh resolve to keep fighting, keep persisting, keep running the hard race on behalf of their friends and family members, that they would not give up Lord, would you do that this morning? Father, thank you for this time together today. We are so grateful that even when we run, you come after us because that is just the kind of God that you are. We love you. Amen.